Hey everybody, welcome to the Players Take episode 30. I am your host, Justin DeSimone, joined by my co-host, the Juggernaut's only bitch, <laughs> Nacho <laughs> Rice. Fuck you. Fuck you. Oh, what's up, what's up? <laughs> People were memeing that, like it's a lot of people's names now, uh... Like I'm a part time stripper and I do <laughs> and I do <laughs> Are people quoting that again? Yeah. Dude, that is a callback. It's just people just That's start like randomly doing years it. Years ago, man. And it's like in their Twitter handles and everything. It's like the like beginning that. of YouTube. Man, yeah, that video man. now is like offensive, isn't it? Technically. People still love it. A lot it, of N word getting thrown around in there. And, oh man, it's it's, know, it's, it's it's still a great video, man. It is. We oh. we're, we are of course, for those of you who don't know, talking about the oldie but a goodie juggernaut bitch, uh, which is like one of the original original youtube man hits that thing man that thing is oof, good stuff um if you want to if you want a window into 2006 <laughs> there's your window man you see my motherfucking spaceship it's a dodge <laughs> Who are oh. you, you red looking mustard looking ha, motherfucker? Ha, ain't that a bitch? I'm gonna catch a motherfucker. Mustard. 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 I'm catch a motherfucker. Oh my god. Oh man. Get him, Julie. Mm. Mm, my chest. My bloody chest. Hey, shout out to that. They're actually still making videos. They do, they do like they? Uh, block v- yeah. type videos. And the dude yeah. who actually voiced Juggernaut, yeah. he had cancer, but he beat it. So oh, wow. shout out to him, man. Damn, dude. Yeah. Jeez, man. It's been a long time. I mean, yeah. a lot of shit's happened. They're probably in their like 30s now. Yeah. Right? Um, did you ever watch their Naruto ones? No, I watched your Power Ranger ones, dude, though. Dude, the Naruto one is <laughs> fucking hilarious. Rock Lee is just, oh my God. So good. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. Everybody, if you haven't listened before, the player's take is our weekly show where we talk about video games, video game news, and other topics pertaining to video games. Uh, we post at 6 a.m. Central Time on Fridays on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, <coughs> Google Podcasts, and your favorite podcast app of choice. Montreal, let's start with what we have been playing. What have you been playing this week, my friend? Uh, I've been moving, so I haven't had a real chance to play anything. Yeah, I barely played anything either. My computer has been DOA. Uh, I've been dealing with that for a week. Yeah. Basically a legitimate full week. <laughs> And yeah, I I just hooked my computer back up. So the only thing I've been playing is my Switch. But even then, I, like I said, I was moving and everything of that nature. So I really didn't want to get into anything too big because once I start playing the game, I won't focus on moving. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I did complete the move thanks to uh, Dennison. Shouts out to his podcast. Oh man, yeah, man, he helped you out. Yeah, man, what a nice guy he is. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And that's all I've been doing. I haven't. Re- I played Fire Emblem, but I barely passed. Did you get like? F- did you even do a battle? I did the first mission. A part two. A part two, okay. and that's it. Like I haven't. Okay. <laughs> I'm still. I'm still in that so, after the five year time skip. I've played. I probably. I think I've done about three chapters. I think I was in chapter fourteen. In last week's episode, I'm on now. I'm on chapter 18. Okay. Um, and I'm I'm pretty much on the final battle for Edel, Edelgard's route. Um, and I will <coughs> say blemishes are definitely starting to show. Okay. Uh, her route is her route's probably one of the worst ones to start with. Thinking about it now in retrospect, from a story standpoint, hers is great to start with because you learn a lot about the world and stuff. But from a gameplay standpoint, man, you just don't have time because you have <laughs> four less chapters than the other uh, the other routes. That like I'm not able. I'm I'm at a point where my characters aren't like finished. You know, and I'm. Oh, I'm you not get four gonna, less chapters. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to finish them. Yeah, her route is just shorter than the other ones. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, like I have a bunch of characters who I've had builds in mind for that I'm really not gonna get a chance to get to because I don't have time. Like I've run out of time. <laughs> wow. I'm on the final battle, so it's like it is what it is. Um, so the thing is, I, kind of where I'm at now is that my subsequent playthroughs, I am going to be planning things out way more meticulously. Yeah. Because I didn't know what mastering the classes gets you in terms of skills, and a lot of them are shit. Uh, for the most part, like some classes give you terrible skills when you master them, okay. like garbage skills that you're not going to use. And um, 
they're useless so i don't need to waste my time leveling in them if i have access to a class that gives a good skill so yeah. i should just so i need to plan my characters out better um i have characters that i did not plan out very well yeah uh, hubert being one of them that he is kind of there's a class called the dark knight that is literally built for him and i didn't do i didn't level his lances up because he sucks at physical attacks so yeah he's like yeah, not they... able to get into the class now because i don't have lances leveled and it's too late like i'm too far into the game so yeah so that's the weird thing about that game mm -hmm. um especially the five-year time skip mm -hmm. thing I don't like how they try to predict where you would go with your certain classes. Mm. This isn't spoilers, but mm. um, for people still playing, like, they will try to predict the character's, like, initial thing. So, I'm um, just say, like, for instance, Hilda, for instance, I built her as an armored knight. She's still an armored knight, and that cat, that class actually carried over. But, like, if some I did... Characters change, some characters change. Some characters change. Yeah. Um... And the skill that you would think you that you'll want to you want them to buff, they don't buff. Mm -hmm. uh, they buff a totally different skill. Yeah. So, especially for, I feel like for um, your main character, guys, just you. Unfortunately, you can't control what they do with him or her. Like mm -hmm. you can't. And well, you I have wish, to go really far out of your way to go out away from the path they want you to take with that character <laughs> but what if i do what if i want to make my character a super armored knight like what if i want him to be the tank i mean he's obviously still... i think you could pull it off you just would really have to like work at it even with the that class that takes over everything to, you don't have to stay in that class oh you can get out that class yeah your main character yes oh i didn't know that okay yeah, yeah, yeah. that makes oh, a lot yeah, of for sure yeah you can get out it's just a class like any other okay um, the skill he gets from that class is really good though yeah so yeah. it is kind of worth leveling him in that so edelgard though is a good example of one that i'm kind of annoyed about because she gets two unique classes after the time skip and they're both armored and I was not building her as an armored character. I was building her as a like a berserker. Yeah. And I was kind of building her towards maybe being a wyvern rider later on. And they give you two armored classes unique to her after the time skip. And there's only like six chapters after the time skip. So I'm in the second one now, and I'm not. She has not mastered it yet. So she spent the entirety of part two as an armored character, and that means that she doesn't double anything. Her speed's really low. She, she's a tank. She's super fucking tanky, but she is so good that I feel like her potential is really wasted as an armored character. So I like I almost want to play her path again and like not worry about those classes because the first one they give you the mastered bonus sucks. Yeah. It's plus four luck and plus four charm. It's like, why would I put that on? That's a terrible skill. Like those are those are two of the most useless stats that you want to up. Like they're useful stats, but they're not ones you want bonuses to. Yeah. Like that you're gonna waste a skill slot on. You know. Yeah, it's not like it's giving you plus four strength, plus four speed. That skill, <laughs> that shit on. You know. Like. Yeah, and Claude, he gets a weird. Uh... A weird thing where he, he class, yeah. yeah he gets that rivering class yeah. and honestly switched him back to a sniper yeah because he's it, probably really powerful in that class because he it can fly but he it is, is range, but, but it is it's a range but when i i usually put claude against other range because he can usually dodge mm -hmm. but with that rivering that like takes his stuff way down when he goes well, against he's weak a, against arrows yeah exactly yeah. so um i just turned him back into a sniper because a lot, a lot of the maps that i fight on you you go against a lot of arrow um a lot of archers yeah. so and that's another weird thing about the game too um i don't know if this was in the other games but like blazing sword each one had like a kind of their highest tier class like you know a bowman can come an archer and then i was like that's like the highest you can go right yeah but like it would seem better i don't like how every master class is almost mounted like there are only like maybe two or three master classes yeah, that are so mounted. Six of them are mounted. There's four horse ones and then two flying ones, one wyvern and one Pegasus. Okay. And then the other two, um, there there are sex exclusive classes. Okay, so I did notice that. Females too. get a magic version and males get the war master, which yeah. is the like basically berserker okay. um equivalent. Um Can and females then, become heroes? No. Okay. I don't think so. But yeah, so there's there's those two, and then there's one more, I think, that is um, on foot, and I can't even remember what it is off the top of my head. But 
um, yeah, it is annoying that the master classes are like that because, yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's, I don't, I don't want my whole party to be on a horse yeah. or, or a mo- like flying mob. Like, I don't really like that. You know? Yeah. So, but the thing is, it's like the game has flexibility where you don't have to put anybody in those classes if you don't want to. The problem is, is they give you stat bonuses that are really high yeah. compared to the lower level, cl- the lower tier classes. So, and their skills are really hella worth it. You know, like, dude, but, the War Master gets crit plus 20 in eight. That's straight crazy. up. And, yeah. And then even, I know some people might say like, well, you know, you can dismount them in game or before the game starts, but their movement are it's severely limited. When I had... Claw is a perfect example of this. He's a, the Riven Master, whatever he's called. Um, he, his movement is really high when you're on the beast, but when you're off, his movement is limited. And I switch into a sniper class, his movement is higher than the one he is on the beast. So, um, can can you dismount and then move in the same turn? Yeah. Oh, you can? Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure about that. So, yeah, the whole point of that, I think, is for when you're on terrain that cavalry can't deal with. Yeah. That's really the whole point of it. And I guess for air units, it's when you want to put them in a place where they're going to get hit by archers. Yep. So they don't get, you know, bonus damage on them. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the game, I still love the game a lot. Oh, yeah, I do too. But yeah, these it, little things are things that I just need to be more prepared as a player yep. for my next playthrough and how I build my party. I, I am honestly, I'm just going to go on the wiki and like build every character out before I even start playing, you know? Yeah. And like figure out exactly what skill loadouts I want with them and like just go down that path. Because playing it willy nilly, where I'm just kind of like, oh, he can go into this class now. I'm just going to try it, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. And then I'm there for like three chapters and, you know, the skill. And then you find out the skill is terrible the, <laughs> the class gets as a mastery skill it's like it's annoying as hell yeah. so um so that that's definitely like one thing that's a little annoying and yeah edelgard's path being shorter than the others I'm, i don't understand why they did that because hers feels really truncated um they don't really take the proper time to tell the story with mm. her um it's very point a point b point c you know see now that's my major complaint yeah. I'm the opposite. Like to yeah. me, it's feel like it's a whole bunch. Of, it's like a filler episode. I'm in right now. I'm like, mm-hmm. what's going on? Oh, we have to build it. We build this. I'm like, what? What? You know, what's going on with Lady Lady Rhea and all this shit like that? And it's yeah. like, yeah. it's it's kind of a filler right now. So, and then on top of that, I'm doing all the support support things too. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what's really slowing me down. Unfortunately, like I feel like I have to kind of do it in spurts the supports yeah. i can't knock them all out at once like if you try to do that you'll be like you're there for you're there for 45 minutes yeah at yeah, least some of these are long yeah like, they're not short yeah i mean I, I like how they're each character has its own you know they're really developed but it's just like sometimes some I of the just, supports aren't great yeah some of the conversations like i don't remember i was trying i'm trying to think of one specifically but there was one i was watching last night when i was playing that was like i was like i just wanted i was like a a a a a i was barely even reading it because it was so boring yeah, like, yeah i couldn't care less about what they were talking about um and yeah i will say too that some of the characters like um when they get to a support i, I mentioned this last week that a lot of them are weird like yeah. romantic and like you'll have one character kind of proposing or like you know presenting it as that them they're getting together and being romantic yeah and it's like it's kind of weird because then there are ones that are just like hey we're really good friends now you know? it's <laughs> yeah. like and those are cool but they play that like romantic music for all of them pretty much it's kind of weird it's fire emblem man so <laughs> you know as much as they put more effort into the supports there are some corners i think that were cut here i mean it makes sense there's a lot of characters and yeah. there's a lot of like permuta- permutations on you know um what characters you have and stuff like that so yeah um but i will say though from the the interesting perspective is like i don't know i really like the fact that a lot of the characters you don't recruit are enemies in whatever route you're in that seems to be i'm gonna guess that's the case on all the routes yeah pretty much because characters you don't recruit you end up fighting for the most part yep and uh, it's really interesting because it puts the game in like a it's dark dude because mm-hmm. yeah you it just, most of them just you just kill them <laughs> that's, that's it you know it's over like so yeah they can't re- they don't retreat usually no sometimes. most of them don't retreat it's it's pretty pretty over so yeah, yeah it's kind of an interesting like gameplay thing like i didn't get that far at petra but i'm interested when we do mm-hmm. you know go farther into it how when we fight that faction mm-hmm. how she's going to react to that because she was all for that yeah i'm really impressed with the integration of the characters not from your house 
into the storyline like they don't they're not integrated into story cutscenes, but you do the exploration and you talk to them and you um you even have supports with them sometimes yeah. that, are, that are catered around the fact that they betrayed their their country yeah and Petra whatever. was really a really good one because yeah. she felt yeah. like when, when she came back and that whole situation happened she was just like yeah I'm really glad you're here for me because I don't know if I should just go with my people or my gut or I'm doing this for my people so what should I do and it's just like I was just yeah. like damn like I didn't yeah. mean to do this to you, you know well, dude yeah some of the characters like one of them um, you fight his father and like he talks about that like you know a lot actually yeah. and it's very interesting and then you actually fight him and like when the two of them come to blows he the father beelines for his kid like what? straight up will target him no matter what the situation is and yeah it's like really interesting so it like forces the conversation to happen in the middle of combat got you so i really recommend if you do um recruit characters from other houses and they're going up against their family members put them in the battle because it's it's worth listening to the lines like it's very it's not you're not getting a lot you're getting like one or two lines but, but still those one or two lines make a difference it's adding some layers though to things yeah. that are happening and, and to the characters you have so, i'm really impressed man so I, i'm very impressed with that element because that's a lot of effort dude i'm wondering what they're going to do next like yeah. i'm really wondering with intelligence systems like the next game yeah i really think this is rife for a sequel yeah, but I'm wondering how how much they're gonna go in depth, what they're gonna improve on, what they're gonna like take away from I'm, this game. Yeah, I'm yeah. really because they're getting universal praise right now. Yeah, similar to Breath of the Wild. Like, what do you take from that? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they had to put in put in as much effort, if not more, to yeah. top this game because well, cause the next game very very likely will not have the teaching element to yeah. it. Yeah. Like they would really have to force that. Yeah, to exactly. Make that a reality again, so it's going to be probably more unless they go into a different like um, world or they build another world. They'd or have something. to build a new place. Yeah. I, like if they made a sequel in this world, I sincerely doubt you would have the professor student setup. That yeah, is in this game, like I don't think you'd be able to do it. They, they can do it like a general to his soldiers type thing. You yeah, know? you could. Yeah. You can integrate it in a different way where you're doing like drills and training. And exactly. Stuff like that. Yeah, you could do that, but. I don't know if it would be as in depth as it is in this game. Yeah. Um, so we'll see what they take away. I would like to see them kind of go back to more traditional Fire Emblem and maybe add some exploration elements similar to what was in uh, Shadows of Valentia. Okay. Where you're kind of like, you can go into dungeons and explore dungeons and stuff like that. Okay. That'd be kind of cool, maybe. But um, I don't know. I mean, we're we're really far away from that. They still have DLC they have to support this game with and stuff like that. So, I mean, we're really far from the next game. So. Oh, yeah. Probably but, the next three years or something like that. Yeah. But I think this world is just really well built. It's similar to the Talius games where I think a, a sequel makes a lot of sense here. Yeah. And I would be really interested to see it. One thing I will say is that all of these games are supposed to take place in the same world for the most part okay so i heard and we're getting to a point where there's so many of them that it's kind of hard to believe that they're all in the same like i heard planet. a theory that they never verify that they never said like these take place I in mean, the same world it was they, like all okay. fan made okay <laughs> that's not entirely true because some of the earlier games did take place in the same world and that is a confirmed thing like okay. shadows of valenti at the end of that game you you do some missions that are close to the continent from the first fire emblem gotcha uh, or or Kane or something like that. I think it's what it's called. That's it where Marth is from, and he's the king. Yeah, at doesn't the time that... that Shadows of Valentia is happening. Yeah, that's that storyline. Yes. that actually follows Awakening. Right, Awakening comes after all of that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and then Awakening is way in the future. Yeah. of Marth's timeline. Yeah. Right. So that's in the same world as well. But then, like Blazing Swords, in its own timeline potentially i don't know so they, yeah they've never really spelled this out but the thing is like I, what i would like to see actually is maybe some sort of expansion to the game scope where we're not just focusing on one continent or like a couple different land masses like i kind of like to see the world a little mm, bit more yeah. and maybe these it, it, see if these places are all in the same world well you know? yeah, they can they can do that maybe not just as a Fire Emblem esque game, it can have the title of Fire Emblem, but be a totally different genre. Or maybe like a, a strategy game. Like a strategy game. Did or... you ever play Brigandine? No. Oh, okay. The Brigandine is a PS One strategy game where you uh, there were there was a continent that it was embroiled in war, and there were six factions on it. 
and you had to pick one of the factions at the beginning of the game. Yeah. And they all had different parts of the continent. Um, and all of them had different characters they started with and monsters and units and stuff like that. They all had kind of a unique build-out. Yeah. Um, and the goal of the game was to take the whole continent over for every single one of the factions. And it played out different for every single faction. So, um, and that game was like, the battles would be um, isometric, sort of like, it's just a strategy game yeah, yeah. where it was like hex-based. Um, and each unit was like singular. It had its own, like every unit was, there were no like... Um, Battalions or anything like that. It was yeah. like you had like three squads, and everyone had a, every squad had a commander, and then it had as many units as that commander could support. Yeah. And then you could deploy three at a time in a battle. And those battles, you could actually have combat where you would fight multiple factions at the same time mm -hmm. um, in that game. So I would love to see a Fire Emblem game that's got a bigger scope, multiple land masses and continents that plays sort of like that. Okay. That would be really cool. Never gonna happen though, so I can keep dreaming. I guess. Yeah, they or they can do like um. I was thinking maybe they can do like um. Maybe like a strategy, action game type deal where only a couple games did this. And one game that it really did it was um, Battalion Wars, on the GameCube yeah. and uh, PS2 I think, mm -hmm. but where you can take over the soldier and it becomes a third person shooter type okay. game but you still control the rest of the army as well yeah and it was certain ways you can do it by you can like pause it and give certain units commands and anything like that so i was like thinking maybe you can do that with like a fire emblem game where you can take control of the hero yeah but you still control your armies and things of that nature tell them go over here and go over there but your direct influence can still influence the battle if that makes mm -hmm. any sense yeah. but it's not so much to where strategy is not involved you just can't steamroll through everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. you yeah. know so yeah. maybe they can do something like that but or maybe you hit up Sega and be like, "Hey, get Creative Assembly to make a Total War game." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'd be interesting. Yeah. I like to see how they'd integrate the leveling system of Fire Emblem into that. Yeah, it'd be kind of interesting, but I don't. That'll never happen. So it's just a pipe dream. But um, anyways, I, I, whatever game we get, like I, if they do another game in this universe, this game's universe, I would be really interested in that. Yeah, I would like me to explore too. this more. So, all right, let's move on to news. Uh, we got a few big stories this week. Um, first one, this is probably the biggest one of the week. This is huge. So, hardware makers, uh, that would be Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony, are going to, this was reported by the ESA this week, they are going to require all games on their platforms disclose drop rates for loot boxes and this is uh they have agreed to do this by the end of 2020 so basically by the time the new consoles are out this will be a thing <clears throat> um and this is just a verbal agreement this is not a con contract in any way or anything like that they're not necessarily held to do this but they all said they would do it and then a bunch of publishers also said they're planning on doing this soon. Um, those publishers include Activision Blizzard, Bandai Namco, Bethesda, Bungie, yeah. EA, Take Two, uh, Ubisoft, Warner Bros., Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. And a wild. <laughs> a wild phone call has appeared. Um, anyways, so this. Um, it's interesting that a lot of. Publishers are already getting on board with this and are planning to um, implement this themselves on the publisher level with their developers. This is, I mean, this is obvious reaction to the all the government, um, all the government kind of interference that has been threatened in recent months. That the things that have happened, like Belgium banning loot boxes outright, the government, uh, the U.S. government looking into this in multiple states, uh, multiple senators talking about this, also them getting grilled in the U.K. and the EU in general. With yeah. this. Um, it's obvious that this kind of has started to, I think, scare these companies straight. That they realize if they don't do something about this, they're gonna get regulated. Like there's no way around it you know i think it's i think it's obvious that that has had a huge influence on them and to see microsoft sony and nintendo do this makes a lot of sense i think they want to just get this headache out of their way like at this point this is that's all this is is a headache and obviously i understand that these are um the monetization scheme of loot boxes is the sky is the limit for this stuff but this is just inevitable players hate this 
kind of monetization scheme and we've seen a lot of we've seen a few games get rid of loot boxes entirely um rocket league being one of those yeah they've gotten rid of loot boxes and they're implementing a fortnite style battle pass that um is going to take over as their kind of free to play monetization scheme even though the game's not free to play um but their recurring um model for um monetization and then even activision blizzard has talked about that overwatch loot boxes are are down like revenue on those is down so it seems like even interest in loot boxes in general has gone down i think people have gotten more educated there's been a lot more in the press kind of talking about loot boxes there's plenty of people on youtube talking about loot boxes i think this has become a really hot button topic and i think people's awareness of it has gone up and i think i think it's obvious the more you get involved in this how much of a scam these things are yeah i mean this it's gambling just, yeah yeah well it's gambling and then they're also how they're trying to hook you psychologically yeah um we were talking about this earlier that the disclosure of rates is going to change the behavior of people purchasing loot boxes because when you have a loot box and this is probably going to change the rates as well i bet some of these loot boxes are horrific like they're <laughs> yeah they're probably horrible they're probably like, gonna patch them up your chance to win to get the super rare cosmetic out of some of these loot boxes is probably less than a one percent you know and that's extremely low that's less than one in a hundred chance you know and when the loot box costs you 200 250 like 250 per loot box you'd have to spend 250 dollars to have a realistic chance of even getting one of that cosmetic and it's not even a guarantee you're gonna get it yeah you know i mean so, i agree i mean it's... so disclosure of that is gonna change player behavior in the sense that if you see that the cosmetic has a one percent chance of dropping you can do the math now and people are going to do the math reddit is going to do the math you know if, yeah. if you say you have a one percent chance to get this and it's gonna, gonna be gonna on calculate some... how many loot boxes you're gonna get it on average and that's gonna be on someone's favorite youtube YouTube channel's page exactly. and then they're going to get educated yep. and then they're going to tell their yep. friends and yep. they're like and it's going to sh- spread so i'm glad this is happening i mean unfortunately we had to get the government involved but they're not involved they I didn't mean, actually get involved they, i mean they're not actually the, I mean, the threat Belgium, yeah the, the, but not here yeah the threat of them getting involved here that you know, trigger them uh, hardware makers to do this, and it should never come to that point. It, it's happened in the past, though. The ESRB ratings are same thing happened in the nineties. The government threatened um, regulation because of you know violence in games, and yeah. they wanted because it wasn't spelled out that there was violence in games. Oh, it wasn't regular. There, were, there yeah. were no ratings similar to movies. Like movies didn't have ratings, and then they did because they needed them. Um, the ESRB is a sim- was the same thing in the 90s, like with this. They got threatened and they self regulated, you know? Yeah. And then they got off their backs. So we'll probably see a similar thing here. I think they're going to drop this probably. I mean, this isn't a permanent solution, but this is enough. Not a, This is enough to me where I think this is going to dissuade developers from making loot box, putting loot boxes in their game because. I just don't think like when you have to be upfront about how gross it is. Yeah. It's. You're either you you have two strategies now. You can either make your loot boxes really generous, but what that does is that you're not going to sell as many of them because people are going to get the items they want more quickly. Yeah, exactly. Because the rates are higher. So if you want to continue to get that like those higher amounts of purchases and you still want low rates, well, people know it now. So I think that's going to dissuade people from buying loot boxes if the rates too low. You know? Yeah. So it's kind of a it's kind of a catch twenty two. You're kind of losing money no matter what. So I think what's going to happen is there, a lot of these games are going to push towards the Fortnite battle pass model, which a lot of them already have. PUBG pretty much got rid of loot boxes and went to the battle pass. As I said, Rocket League's already doing it. Blizzard's thinking about it. You know, I think that's why we're getting an Overwatch too is because I think they want to reevaluate monetization in that game, but they want to do it with a new game. Yeah. You know? um, so, and they want to design that game from the ground up with that monetization in mind, you know? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> It's just a shame that you have to say that. But yeah. I know, but it's it's reality for them, though. If, yeah. they, if they try to just hacksaw something on Overwatch over the loot boxes or get rid of the loot boxes, it just wouldn't work as well because the game's not designed for it. You yeah. Know? It wasn't designed from the ground up with that in mind, you know? So, um, so that's kind of just the reality of it. And I think, I think, like, I don't want to say that this is the death of the loot box, but honestly, I really think we're going to see a lot less of loot boxes in the future. I mean, you know, it was funny. I remember when the whole idea of loot boxes were first came out, especially in Overwatch. Yeah. We kind of looked at it as a, a, 
um, a beacon, right? A sign of like, oh man, we gotta pay for these DLC packs and stuff like that because mm-hmm. that was getting out of hand. Mm-hmm. Like people were holding half the game hostage yeah. over DLC, and then <clears throat> Overwatch announced that they're like, hey, we're gonna release these free characters, we release these maps. Yep. You know, how do you guys get your money? Well, you know, we got these loot boxes, and the people that buy it, you know, they're essentially paying for the game, and the other people mm-hmm. that aren't paying for it, they still get the content free and everything like that. Yep. As yep. far as maps and uh, characters, yeah, and it's just funny how that all took a turn, like for the worst. Like, EA did it. Yeah, like it just Battlefront Two was so egregious that they changed the conversation. And Shadow cra- of War came out before that game, and it, it was didn't... bad, but EA pushed it over the edge with Battlefront Two. And I think Madden's a lot worse. And that, but that wasn't the totally. That game wasn't even on the fire. It was. It was Battlefront. <laughs> and I am really interested to see how it affects that game. Yeah, uh, Madden and FIFA. Uh, does it affect their bottom line? I don't know. It might not. They said they make almost a billion dollars. Yeah, it's like eight hundred million a year is generally their average that's, revenue. For, that's ridiculous. For it. Yeah, it's crazy, dude. That's just off Madden, I think. That that's ridiculous. I, they could probably even make more off FIFA because that's yeah. a worldwide. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Soccer is like way more popular than American football. Yeah. Um. So, I'm. I'm interested in seeing what 2K is going to do too with their uh, my player because even though they didn't have loot boxes, they had these egregious microtransactions, yeah. and yeah. a lot of the players, to my surprise, not saying anything wrong with 2K players, but uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> they are like responding to this, and they're like, "Why do I got to pay this for all my skill points when I should just be able to play the game and get the skill points?" So, um, even that whole thing of buying gold and buying your way up yeah. to build a character, I think that's going to slowly yeah. disappear yeah no and I, I think the Fortnite battle pass is kind of the model we're going to see going forward like it just makes the most sense it's something that is not looked at negatively I mean even I my opinion of it is I think it's a pretty benign form of microtransaction actually because it's straight up with you it's very upfront. it's transparent it tells you most games with their battle passes you can look at the battle pass before you purchase it yeah you know some are like I'll get into Dota in a second. <laughs> but uh, I want to talk about Fortnite. Specifically, like, Fortnite lets you get the Battle Pass, and you just gain experience by playing games. Yeah. You know, and um, you if you play enough, you can get through the whole Battle Pass pretty easily. Okay. You know, or at least when I when they first introduced it, that was the case. Maybe it's worse now. I don't know. But, um, but the game tells you exactly what levels you're going to get what at so at level one you're going to get these cosmetics at level two you're going to get 200 v bucks at level three you're going to get this uh skin at level four you're going to get like a dance or whatever you know it's like stuff like that and yeah. that's how these are structured in most of these games and the degree of shittiness to them is going to vary based on the game and the developer and the publisher but um, Fortnite, but the idea of a battle pass by itself is not offensive to me. It's just the thing is, is like people are probably going to equate this to like back in the day, there were a lot of like secret unlocks in most games. That's kind of what the battle pass is now. It's kind of yeah. replacing that that idea, and you have to pay for it. But you're only paying like ten or fifteen bucks most of the time, and it gives you objectives to achieve within the game. You yeah, know? it's like it's it's kind of a fun thing when you actually get into it and really are committed to a game. Like it's kind of cool. You're like leveling up, and you're earning things so it's like it's giving you some progression on the side on top of whatever the game already has i'm just thinking how they can fuck that up (laughs) well uh, let's let's talk about it so dota okay they have battle passes they've had battle passes for a long time they had battle passes before fortnite ever came up with them okay (laughs) what what a surprise dota did loot boxes before most games did (laughs) they also did and they just fly under the radar they also did battle passes before most games did nobody talks about this by the way like for some reason valve has completely flown flown under the radar with this (laughs) i don't understand how because they are one of the worst examples of both of these things in the industry their loot boxes are horrific their rates are terrible and they do not disclose rates and also they're not a part of this so they may not disclose rates still yeah. and they may not require people to disclose rates so they're still going to be a problem potentially um and then their battle passes dude the international battle pass so they do a battle pass every three months fall winter spring international which is the summer one yeah usually. the international battle pass has gotten to a point of complete fucking absurdity it has a thousand levels on it what yes 
and you can get you don't get experience on the battle pass by playing games just by playing games like you don't get experience for wins you don't get experience on the battle pass for losses you have to complete specific objectives and they'll give you quests you have to do certain things with certain heroes you have to do it's a pain in the ass it's not a fun battle pass because it requires you to play the game in a certain way play with certain characters it's not fun i hate it um i hate the way they do this and there's like a thousand levels and the thing is the quests they'll give you like one level and you can do like two a day so oh, we have a cap lasts on it. like 90 days even if you do all the quests you're only getting 180 levels out of that well how do you get the rest of the levels well you can buy them that's how mm. and of course they put all the really cool shit past the point you can get to it for free so this is how you can make it really skeevy and predatory is by doing it that way you let people play get experience for free in a certain way and restrict how much they can get and then you put the cool shit they want at past the point where they can get it for free so can that's you just what buy the does. skins outright no they're exclusive to the battle pass Oh and my God. the uh, Dota's Dota's uh, monetization for this is ridiculous. Like you can buy, um, I think it, you can buy packs of like one level, five levels, ten levels, twenty five levels, or twenty four levels, forty eight levels, and then I think like seventy five levels or so, or hundred levels or something like that. They they change this every year, but um, a forty eight pack of levels I think is like. Thirty dollars. That's ridiculous. Forty-eight levels, and there's a thousand levels in the battle pass, and it actually is an endless. It doesn't end at a thousand. It keeps going endlessly. You can level infinitely, and they'll give you every like twenty-five or fifty levels. They'll give you three immortal chests, three immortal loot boxes that give you the immortal skins that they release for every international every year. Which are those are the special skins that look really cool. They kind of are shiny and glow, and they yeah. they make your character do different animations and stuff like that. But yeah, it's like like it goes endlessly. And I know a guy on Dota every year for the international. He has a battle pass for the for the international. He's at like level thirty five hundred. I'm like, bro, how much money did you spend, dude, to get to level thirty five hundred without playing, like just buying outright? You're looking at a thousand dollars probably. That's, that's ridiculous. So yeah, it can be done in a really bad way. It can be. I'm just thinking. I just don't think most developers are gonna do that. I think Valve is an extreme example with Dota 2, mm-hmm. and they've been an extreme example with both battle passes and loot boxes. And I just, they're they're like the worst of the worst almost. They're not as bad as Madden. I mean, they kind of are actually. Thinking about, it. <laughs> they're pretty bad. They're in that they're in that bottom tier of like worst of the worst. Yeah, you know, and they have been with both. So, um, I, I just think more often than not, most most companies are going to be better than that. So just naturally. You know, because Valve is so bad about it. So that is kind of one concern I have about the battle pass trend. But for the most part, I think most games are going to be pretty cool about it. Like, like Fortnite gives you in-game currency. When like you buy yours, and as you level it, you'll get in-game currency for doing it. Okay. And their battle passes actually have a cool thing where you can do a certain portion of it for free. So you can play over a certain number of seasons, and, and they'll actually give you V bucks in the battle pass. And um, even the free one. And if you play long enough, you'll get enough points to be able to buy a battle pass. And then you'll you can use that battle pass to then buy subsequent battle passes because you get V bucks in the battle pass. So they just want to keep you playing. Sounds like pretty much right. And they just kind of I think use that as a hope that you will buy skins outside of the battle pass, which I'm sure is what happens. Yeah, I mean I would buy skins. I'll buy skins. Hell yeah, if I like a game that much. Yeah, I buy skins. I mean totally. I just and I think that's what the model should be go back to i think people should just hey make cool skins it's more up front yeah just be just make cool skins and make make a cool game people will invest in your game once you make a cool game yeah. but i don't know i guess developers or the ceos are still trying to do skeevy ways to get m- money for easy <laughs> i mean it's yeah dude i mean they're trying to find those endless le- revenue streams that's their goal so it's uh make an actual good game <laughs> yeah, it's not that hard. I don't know. But all right, let's move on to the next story. Uh so we talked about the Switch last week getting a battery revision or a few weeks ago, whatever the what whatever the case. That is actually out. 
now as of recording um you can find that out in the united states if you live in the u.s um you should be able to find it it has a different box from the original switch it's very red like the box is mostly red Mm -hmm. um whereas the old switch kind of has a gray background it has like a hand person's hand like touching the switch or whatever um so that's kind of the main way you can tell you can also go online and look at there's different serial numbers on each box um that denotes which one's which um but there is another potential revision coming to the switch uh that has been reported um that they're going to be potentially um the wall street journal journal uh, released a report saying that the uh, the Japanese electronics maker Sharp is going to supply Igzo screens to Nintendo for future switches. Um, and what this is is basically the Igzo screens are going to be better quality screens than the, what is existing on the Switch right now. Okay. So games may look a little bit better. Like transparency on these screens is better than what's on the Switch now. So games may lo- look a little better. And also power consumption is going to be lower because the backlight won't be need to be as bright because gotcha. of the, the screen's um, transparency level. So. This could result in another battery increase for the Switch in the coming months. There's Great. no time frame on this, but man, dude, yeah. they're just like they're just piling new stuff on the Switch. Well, I mean, they probably got a lot of people coming to them for different things. Yeah. <laughs> so they probably just got people lined up like, hey, we can improve this part. Mm-hmm. We can improve this part. I bet you're right. I mean, they. I don't want to say it's an overnight success, but the Switch kind of surprised a lot of people as far as success, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, everyone was kind of riding the PS4's balls for a while. Oh, for sure. And then the Switch well, came out. Wii U was such a dis- oh, yeah. disgraceful disaster. Yeah, exactly. That, yeah, nobody believed in Nintendo. Yeah, and it kind of counted them out. And yeah. now that it's getting a lot of third-party support, people are loving mm-hmm. the games. Um, even our society as, as a whole... I know Japanese is mainly mobile, but Americans are becoming a lot more mobile as well. Like, we can't stay at home at, all the time and play our games. Or if we do, you know, we got other people in the house who want to watch stuff and do stuff, so they can't just dedicate all that. So I think the Switch is... It makes sense that everyone's coming to them like, hey, we can improve this, we can improve this, we can improve this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting to see what is going to happen within the next two years with Switch. Well, it excites me in another reason because I was, like, thinking about getting this revision, the one that increases battery life for the yeah. Switch, and now I'm like, oh, shit, do I wait for this better screen? Because I might be able to get 10 hours out of this thing now, dude. <laughs> like, that's exciting as hell. Hell yeah. You know, the idea of the Switch lasting 10 hours was, like, the fuck that's <laughs> impossible but like all of a sudden we're in a situation where that might happen in a few months like yeah i mean it does like i said there's no time frame on this like this probably will take months to roll out and like actually start happening like getting manufactured and stuff and getting on two switches that are getting manufactured now but um still i would say by the end of the year probably if this actually happens that we'll probably start seeing these yeah probably like you said i'm excited about the future too because i mean we haven't heard about a switch pro and I'll be interested to see what they do with it. If they actually want to do something cool, I would man, like let's let's get some more power into this thing. A little yeah. bit more power into this thing, you know? I think um, it's coming. I maybe think a it's bigger real. screen too. Get rid of that fucking bezel. Either a switch two point or just like a Dude, switch upgrade or something like that. Bezel on the switch is ridiculous. Yeah. It's so huge. It's like out of control. It's like <laughs> way too big. You know? Let's get rid of some of that bezel Nintendo. Um all right. Let's move on to the next story. So, uh, a couple months ago, we talked about... uh, There was a report by Jason Schreier that Blizzard had canceled an internally developed um, StarCraft first-person shooter that they were working on, and this was extremely depressing to us. So, there was, uh, I think, an earnings call where they talked about their kind of plans for the future and that they currently have no StarCraft games in development right now and that they are not planning on starting development on any StarCraft games in the near future. And this was really sobering news, I think, for me, that one of the pillars of Blizzard, StarCraft, is kind of done, you know? I mean, yeah, I mean, at least we... Uh, it's kind of It's kind of like a... Uh... You no, know, you put your take your dog out back, and you know it's over, and you can move past you it. Put it to sleep, yeah, yeah. You, you can move past it now. Mm-hmm. I, I can move past it now. Now that I know that they're not going to do anything with this franchise anymore, I can move past it. But I am still insanely sad because there is so much potential in this franchise. I mean, we just talked about StarCraft a couple weeks ago on our Reflections episode, yeah. And dude, like, I just the love I have for that game is is 
second to none, you know? That was a special, special, special game. And the fact that Blizzard doesn't want to do anything with that universe is... It's really unfortunate to me. It kind of it kind of makes me think that they're not. I mean, we know we know they're not focused on. Um, there's certain things they're not focused on anymore. And I really don't think story is one of the things they're focused on. Yeah. And that was the best story they've ever had in a game, and it probably will be the best story they ever have. You know, yep. period, straight up. Like until Blizzard goes out of business in 50 years, whatever that is. <laughs> you know, if that ever happens. But um, it's. It's just, dude, it just sucks to, to hear it from their mouth, you know, that they're not interested in pursuing StarCraft anymore because I don't understand why they can't figure this out, you know? They've canceled two StarCraft games that were f- shooters, third person and first person. And and I, I, just, I just feel like they didn't give it a chance. Yeah. I feel like even if you're iffy about it, like release a demo and see how, how many downloads get out there, see how many, see how the, the reception is towards it. Like, I just feel like they never try. I feel like whoever's running it just never try. Why does it have to be a shooter, too? Like, why... You could make like a RPG or something like that. Maybe an XCOM game. Shit, or yeah, an XCOM <laughs> game. Yeah, exactly. Do like an XCOM game, a strategy game, or dude, you can make like a, a Fallout S game. Yeah. With it, like it's just. <sighs> I mean, the potential is there, and it's all there. It's it, like like you said, it's probably nothing's probably not going to come out this franchise until Blizzard is down the ground and starts selling off IPs and someone I mean, I picks would this say up. Bare minimum, I don't expect a StarCraft game for ten years at least. That's that's wild. Because by the time they start thinking about doing one again, I mean that's going to be a few years from now, and then it's going to take them five years to make the game. Yeah, you know, probably so. Um, yeah, and I just think Overwatch is now the third pillar. Like, it is officially the third pillar. And that's sad. <laughs> it really is sad. I mean, I know a lot of people like Overwatch. It's just, it never been my cup of tea. So. I will say, five years ago, I would have told you, you are insane if you think Warcraft is going to be the thing that Blizzard pursues over StarCraft. I would have told you you're insane. Really? Because at the time, there was nothing new on the horizon for Warcraft. Like, yeah. dude, World of Warcraft was just churning out shitty expansion after shitty expansion, and there was nothing else in the pipeline for Warcraft. Like, they weren't talking about new... They weren't talking about Warcraft 4. They weren't talking about, like, doing anything interesting in the Warcraft universe. And all of a sudden, we're getting a full-on remake for Warcraft 3 that looks like the level of effort for this is completely ridiculous. Like, yeah. dude, there's, the models in this game are, are starting... Like, I, the screenshots I'm seeing for the models, if these are the in-game models that are gonna like you're going to be playing the game with, are they're nuts. The level of detail is insane. It's insanely high. So I'm, like, so impressed with that game. And then we got World of Warcraft Classic coming out. And honestly, depending on how Warcraft 3 Reforged does, we could be, like, people are all, uh, tons of people are talking about Warcraft 4 being the next game that Blizzard makes. You know? And it's, like, the idea of that five years ago was, like, that was a distant, distant hope for me. Like, that Mm. was, like, like, if my wildest dream were to come true, it would be Warcraft 4. And I'm in a reality now where that might actually happen, you know, and that, yeah. that's crazy to me. And I hope it does so, happen. I mean, as much as StarCraft going away is sad, I mean, that may be to the benefit of a franchise I do love as well, which yeah. is Warcraft. So um, we'll see. I guess we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm curious. I, I think Classic, World of Warcraft Classic is going to do really well. There were queues yesterday to sign up to get your names reserved on, on freaking servers. Like, yeah, it's ridiculous. So, you know. Um, and then, yeah, Warcraft 3 for Reforge is... I, I don't think it's going to be as popular as Warcraft, World of Warcraft, obviously, but um, I think it could... I hope it's the shot in the arm that the RTS genre really needs because that is a game, I think, that will really appeal to the MOBA crowd. Yeah. It is It is the game that really made the idea of MOBAs, like, possible, you know? Yeah. Warcraft 3 is that game. Yeah. It bridged the gap between micro and macro in a way that StarCraft never could. Starcraft is like 85% macro, 15% micro. Yeah. Warcraft 3 is like 60% micro, 40% macro. And that is what I found way more fun in the RTS genre. As much as I love Starcraft, gameplay wise, I think Warcraft 3 is a better game. Yeah, yeah. It's just more fun. Like winning games because you didn't build your fucking uh, hatchery at three minutes or whatever is like <laughs> yeah. that's not fun gameplay yeah. fun gameplay to me is maneuvering my units around my opponent and outplaying them you mm-hmm. know like that's more fun to me and that's what Warcraft 3 is yeah so I think that I think that game could do really well 
I do think so. so Interesting. I hope so. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next story. This one is wild, dude. So, Borderlands 3, man, the controversy around this game never ends. Like, there's the, there's the boycott I, Borderlands 3 going around. I don't know who's in charge of their PR, but People he has to be, like, losing his hair. Randy Pitchford, the, the hate for Randy Pitchford has never been higher. Um, I mean, justifiably so. <laughs> Dude's done some crazy stuff. But um, the, this latest story. So uh, 2K, uh, Take-Two, sorry. Yeah, t- Take-Two and 2K Interactive. There was a YouTuber named Sup, uh, Supmato who was a basically a Borderlands 3 YouTuber. Yeah. Borderlands YouTuber. And he was doing a ton of videos hyping Borderlands 3, talking about Borderlands 3 leaks and news and all sorts of stuff like that. So Take-Two apparently took issue with some of the stuff this guy was talking about. And they sent private investigators to his house basically to ask him questions and then tell him to cease and desist on um, his YouTube channel. So let me read some quotes here. Um, Quote, Take two and 2K, take the security and confidentiality of trade secrets very seriously, says the publisher. The action we've taken is the result of a 10 month investigation in a history of this creator profiting from breaking our policies, leaking confidential information about our product, and infringing our copyright. This is kind of a garbage quote in my opinion like this is I, I, the, the, the fact that they take issue with him profiting from this is the part that is ridiculous you know because there are dozens of news sites that report on every Borderlands 3 leak rumor what have you and they profit on every single click that comes into their website yeah. for ad dollars and what whatever you know and this guy this guy isn't necessarily even leaking anything new. He's just mostly, from what I understand, was reporting on information that was already known, leaks that were already known, and he was getting some information from sources that he knew, maybe internally, maybe maybe not internally, maybe associated with the game in some capacity, people who knew things that he didn't know um, and that were not widely known. So he probably he did break some stuff, but it it leaking confidential like leaking information about a game that's not out yet that is not illegal the way the information is attained it matters which is the part that we're we cannot be sure about right if he hacked 2k or take two and gearbox to obtain uh information like screenshots um game files things like that if he did that that is illegal yeah but there's no indication that he did that. If he knows somebody that did that, that I don't. I, this is the problem. I don't. I don't think that's illegal. But I don't think it's illegal for him to report on that information if he gets it secondhand. If he doesn't know it was obtained illegally, I think if he knows it was, then that would be illegal. But if he doesn't know that the person got the information by hacking Take Two, yeah, it's plausible deniability. It, he doesn't like. He doesn't know it was an illegal. Yeah, it's the equivalent thing, to so. a, a journalist having the source. Yes. Like, yeah, an internal source, and that happens all the time. Jason Schreier openly says in every one of his articles, we talked to 20 employees from such and such company. Yeah. You know, they all wanted to be anonymous to save their jobs. Like, somehow that's not illegal. Like, <laughs> talking about the internal workings of studios, like, they don't have an issue with that. That's my issue with this story is that they're literally, they they chose this guy because he's a single individual who yep. runs a YouTube channel, and they just, they thought he was an easy target. They wanted to make an example out of him. That's all I think this is. And they did. I mean, but he's literally hyping up your game. I know. I don't. I don't get it either. I. I don't know. When you when companies go out these YouTubers and after the community that like loves them, it's like, yeah, we want to mess up our money even more. Like I. Don't, I don't. I don't know. Maybe it's the lawyers that talk or whatever. Like you know, Nintendo did that. Remember f- for a while. Oh yeah. Before they had their Nintendo program, where you had to like join. Finally. Act like stopped. Yeah. Shit the past like like six months. Yeah. Finally, after like years yeah. of people begging them to stop being so like arcane. Yeah. Their policies about YouTube. And I think that was just because of the lawyers, like yeah. the lawyers of For like sure. Nintendo. Yeah, dude, a hundred percent. Um, but like, 
I, I just think the the marketing department and the lawyer the, the law department don't really talk. Like mm-hmm. lawyer, people were like, "Hey, this is like free marketing for us. We, our sales go up because this YouTuber did this. Like they go up like one percent or two percent." And the lawyer's like, "Man, no, nah, we can make more money off the, like just suing them." Like, like a good example of this is um, I like to listen to video game soundtracks on YouTube. Yeah, and. Um, Fire Emblem Three Houses just came out, and the game has it. I didn't mention this. The game has a really good soundtrack. Fantastic soundtrack. I like it a lot. <laughs> um, so I've been trying to listen to it on YouTube, and Nintendo is going insane. <laughs> they are taking down every video of this game soundtrack, and they have a full right to do this. Right? Yeah, it's their yeah. copyrighted game. Anybody trying to profit off this on YouTube, like putting ads up on those videos, like fuck off. Like it's not your music, right? But at the same time, it's like it's like what you just said. I can't like I don't I don't know of a way to buy the soundtrack to Fire Emblem Three Houses unless I buy the special edition of the game, which does not have all the tracks, by the way. <laughs> it does not have full versions of all the tracks. Okay. So it's like I don't even have a way to really buy that. So I want to listen to the music though. So and, and like you said, it just increases exposure to the game. Like if you have a video of a soundtrack that is like got a million views people are going to notice that you know and it's like yeah. maybe that brings new people into the game you know a lot of people i know listen to soundtracks of video games even my girlfriend yeah. did it i'm like she was listening to a final fantasy x soundtrack and i'm like oh this is final fantasy x She's like, oh i listen to this while i'm doing homework it's helped me yeah. focus i'm like really like yeah yeah it, yeah it, but she didn't know it was a video game yeah, so yeah, like yeah. Yeah. just just the potential of that yeah you know it might draw people into your game so exactly the thing about this is is like everybody said like i've been reading comments everybody's like man just wait a month they'll calm down and it'll be fine they'll forget about this and move on because it's like they're not it shouldn't have happened in the first place though beat the internet dude like they're 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 like yelling into a wall you know it's like they're not gonna win this battle it it should still shouldn't happen in the first place like Like, are they losing revenue by having the soundtrack to find them three houses on youtube no no in even uh like with Borderlands, this is not hurting your bottom line. People are still gonna buy this game, even with the the, the skill tree thing being uh, you know leaked or whatever. Well, let me read that real quick. Okay. So yeah, one of the things that happened is um, let me just read the article, I guess. Um, so. This situation seemingly dates back to a video that Submato posted, which talked about, amongst other things, a leak related to a Twitch extension. Submato claims that the information wasn't exactly difficult to find and didn't require any serious espionage. Quote, it's not some crafty workaround, said Submato. On April 29th, the official Borderlands YouTube channel posted the reveal of the Twitch extension leading into the gameplay reveal, and the name of the testing accounts were exposed in that video. This wasn't found by me. Even if it was, they posted the video early, you know? Like, yeah. it's their fault that this got leaked. It's like you're going after somebody. So, sending investigators to his house is just so it's ridiculous. ridiculous. Dude, it's such a bully. It's such a bully thing, you know? Like, they're just bullying this dude. And, and like, to me, that particular example is absurd because you leak the information and then it was spread I would, 10 years ago, would you have heard of any game company doing this? No. This is ridiculous. This is, this, is a, this is a change in the industry that has happened as social media has gotten bigger, as we've gotten more exposure to game developers and developers are talking to players more and companies are talking to players more. This has become, it's like, it, it, it's like these companies are all the secret service. And they, need to, <laughs> they need to mask the president's movements because that's how they treat their games. They, they don't, they want this shit. It's like, it's like fucking black ops. Like they, they have to keep this shit so under wraps. Like, oh my God, if our game gets revealed, the, the world's going to explode. It's like, that's how they treat this stuff. And it's like, but it's you, really not that vital. Yeah. You don't see like Disney getting like, I remember when Black Panther was leaked in. Yeah. Certain things of in game were leaked and everything like that. Disney never really lost his shit and was like, Oh my god, we gotta start shutting everything down. And it, it was more so like free exposure, like people were interested in these IPs. It created buzz, yeah. And games, like you said, I think we talked about this like maybe a, a couple podcasts ago, but like, yeah, how these game companies are like super, super, super. The NDA it was one of our NDA disclosure com- <laughs> yeah. uh, conversations, and I just think the idea of the NDA 
in the game company in the game industry is just so wild to me because it's completely insane yeah it's like it's not you would think these people are like licensed doctors handling patients and like just handing out their files to everyone like hey look at this person like or or we're we're we're, uh we're trying to we're trying to keep like national secrets yeah (laughs) like usa secrets away from the russians or something like it's just it's dude this is like to me this is insanity that they're so upset about this because what the reason they're upset is because their perfect little marketing plan didn't go to plan you know like their little hype train didn't go to plan it's like Dude, it creates hype anyways. I think the idea that's scaring a lot of people too. Like yeah. the idea that you don't need a marketing team anymore. All you gotta yeah. do is post your stuff on YouTube and have like a YouTuber do it. Yeah. He's your hype train now. Yeah. Like yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they just it's hard for them to adjust to change, um, in general because it's it's getting ridiculous. Well, this industry is young and like you said with movies. We're at the point with movies that this stuff isn't even... It's, it's not even leaked. Yeah. But they just tell you. They're like, <laughs> yeah, we're working on a Black Panther movie, and we're working on, you know, we got the Inhumans movie, and this movie... It's like Marvel made an event out of their announcements for yeah. post-Endgame stuff, and that's, like, really the one example I can think of of mo- a movie company doing that. Yeah. But, honestly, most other companies are, like, it's known three years before the movie comes out that the movie's being made, well, you know? Well, not only... This just takes another layer, too, right? Where... Games are trying to be so secretive towards each other that they keep it secret towards themselves. Look at look at Anthem for example, right? How long was that game? That game had a secret file, and you could only only these people can access this secret file, which is oh not which is not uncommon in in businesses. Yeah. Well, I mean, even our business has that. But like, yeah, there's certain things that you don't want being public. Right? Yeah, like financial information and stuff like that. That makes sense, but. <laughs> Like you don't want your secret video game to get revealed. Oh, like you, you, you don't even tell your staff like what type of video dude, game you're making. Dude, like come like, on. Honestly, dude, like the the Ubisoft Assassin's Creed leaks are the funniest things ever because they're always like some dude on a train left his laptop open <laughs> or like or mistakenly left a packet of documents that details like the Assassin's Creed game or something. Like an actual Assassin's Creed <laughs> game. <laughs> they're, funny, they're the funniest leaks, and it's such a funny way for. A game to be revealed but it's like you know it's like Ubisoft like honestly they don't really seem to care that much they just roll with the punches like yeah. it's fine you know it's like I'm sure they get pissed about it but I think know, Take 2 is just like going way this is way overboard you know and then, then like it they're, just they're, sucks for this guy cause this guy dude this guy went dark for like a month on his YouTube channel and then came back and was like hey guys yeah this happened to me and he like talked about this whole thing like that he got investigated and talked to these investigators and he's basically like not even sure he wants to play Borderlands 3 anymore and he was like one of the most hype people for it you know one of the biggest super fans for this game and he doesn't even want to play it now and he's like seriously he he's not even sure he's gonna keep doing YouTube it's like I mean that probably scarred him man yeah, like, they like ruined this dude's life for what? Like, and he loves... Because he leaked some skill trees? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> what are we doing? What are we doing here? What the fuck are we doing? It's not like he released a security... The president's social security number, yeah, you the, know? Like, yeah, he, he just... Uh, he's like, oh, man, this stuff leaked on you no know, 4chan today. Like, I don't know, man. And it's not just, like, take two, like... To me, oh, this yeah. is this is like um oh, this, this is, is a this is a step above Nintendo. Nintendo used to be really really <laughs> bad with it. This I don't think Nintendo would do. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, yeah. but I was thinking the other I was looking at something because it was something on either on my news feed or something like that. I don't know where I heard it. I heard it physically, like oh yeah, uh, Nintendo was talking about. Oh, the FCC filings. Mm. They're talking about doing uh, Super NES games, right? And I'm like. Bitch, hurry up and do something since you done sent out sits and deceits to all these uh ROM sites. Mm-hmm. Like, we can't even play your games because you're like, ah, we're going to be selling them. When? Motherfuckers want to buy your games. Yeah. Like, we want to buy your old yeah, shit. The only reason ROMs exist is because the games aren't available. Yeah, exactly. That's the only reason they exist. <laughs> Dude, if the games were available to purchase every single one of them, like ROMs would still exist there'd be people who want to pirate but that's such a small small percentage percentage. they act like like 50% of their customer base is like stealing ROMs it's like no we just want to play your old shit play your old games the fuck and you used to let us do that on virtual console and now it's we have to subscribe to this dumb fucking service (laughs) you're like oh you can play these two games for a month oh that's really cool you have like thousands of games in your back catalog and you give us NES like most of us okay most of us don't even play NES Man, games. Be careful. 
be no, care, be careful. I'm going there. Don't man. Most of us. Oh man. Don't even play NES oh, games. He's doing it. They're trash. Like <laughs> I'm sorry. He's doing it. They're, they're trash. He's doing it. I play Super NES games. Yep. I don't play yep. NES games. I grew up on Super I NES games. I don't fuck with NES games either. Exactly. Yeah. That's not, that's not our, their demographic anymore. They didn't realize their demographic that plays Super NES games. They're like 35. Even then, those people aren't playing Super NES games. They, that's I mean, the they, beginning. That's they, the beginning. Of the they're buying game. the retro consoles, right? Yeah. That's your demographic. Yeah. Yeah. The people who are playing Switch and like paying for your monthly service, mm-hmm. these are people, some of them barely even... 14, 15, yeah. all the way up to like 30. You know, we're playing Super NES games. We grew up on these games. We grew up in the 64 games, GameCube games. Give us those games. Don't yeah. give us this Excite Bike. I don't, I don't care about I don't fucking care about that. Mario Brothers 3 for the 80th fucking time. Like, we get it. Mario Brothers 3 is a good game. We get it. We get it. Give me Bomberman 64. And, I mean, that leads us to another conversation that we we'll probably have next week, but this leads into the whole, you know, digital thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know, man. All right. Yeah. We digress. We digress. 2K, take two, whoever the fuck you are, calm the fuck down. Yeah. You know, Learn something it. from Nintendo, man. You yeah, see how just, just calm down. <laughs> calm down. All right. This last story, this is the last story. Uh, this one is very interesting. So, um, uh... The head of Xbox's first party studios, Matt Booty, good name, um, <laughs> said in a podcast that it might make sense for some of their first party games, first party developed games, to be released on PlayStation and Switch, which doesn't, he didn't mention any particular games necessarily, but. There could be games of theirs that are first party of theirs that are released on the other consoles. And this is fascinating. You were said it before the podcast. This is Microsoft playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers. Yeah. Because this should be the future, my friend. Like, Imagine imagine if Nintendo decided to put like Mario Kart on Steam. What are they doing? I, <laughs> I love the Switch. The Switch is great. Yeah. And the Switch would sell irregardless yes. of the idea of these other their first party games being on other consoles. Yes. I'm sorry, it would because the Switch is just that good of a device. Yeah, you know, and the, the fact that it's handheld is just oh, oh, it's so good. But point being, if they sold Mario or Zelda on the other consoles, they'd sell triple the copies. <laughs> they would. Straight up, they would be the best selling games of the year, whatever year they're released. The only game that would compete with them is like GTA Five. Yeah, because you know that game sells a million copies every week. But. Um, so I feel like Nintendo's leaving a lot of money on the table, but they are of the mindset, and Sony's the same way, that you keep your first-party stuff in-house because it sells your hardware, Yeah. right? And Microsoft, I think what Microsoft's talking about here makes a lot of sense, particularly for them, because there are certain franchises you don't want to make not exclusive, right? Oh, yeah. Like Halo, Halo, Gears, G- makes sense for them, right? Yeah. But certain things like Double Fines games, why would you, why would you make those exclusive to Xbox? You're not gonna sell consoles off Double Fine's game. I think know? they, and I think they really noticed it too when yep. they. I think their test period because they've been doing this actually for a while. They've already right? done it with yeah. Minecraft, but the thing is, Minecraft was already on other platforms. Actually, I was talking about another game, Killer oh. Instinct. Oh. So I think, and a lot of people tweeted this out years ago when Killer Instinct was super hot and it was on Evo and everyone was like, mm-hmm. Killer Instinct's really a really good fighting game. Yeah. Man, imagine if Killing Instinct was on PS4. We can play it with other people. Because mm-hmm. it was already on PC and Xbox only. Yeah. So if it was on the PS4, that could have... A, a lot of people in the FG, FGC community are on PS4. So it, they that was like a whole unexplored <coughs> sector for them. They are like, man, we could have got a lot of those people. And I think this is... I think this is like a, a birth child of that. They're like... Yeah. Maybe we should make Killer Instinct, or you know, if they do make a Killer Instinct two or whatever, make it for all consoles, and that this just makes sense. Like it just makes a lot of more sense because a lot I know a lot of people who don't even own Xbox, they bought an Xbox for Killer Instinct because they just love the mechanics of Fighter uh, Killer Instinct, or they they upgrade their PC so they can play Killer Instinct on their PC. Yeah. So, I, well, dude, the more powerful these devices get, too. Because I, I really think with Sony's next console, we're looking at 600 and honestly, Microsoft's could be the same. When you're starting to get into that price range, it's getting really pricey. Yeah. I can't afford two of these, so I have to pick one, yep. you know? And 
that means I'm not going to play the games on the other one. Even if I want to, you know, I'm not going to get to play the games on the other one. So, and I think they realize that. Yeah, it makes sense from that perspective, too. You know, like you're saying, there are probably a lot of people who don't own Xboxes that want to play Xbox games. You know, they'd love to play Halo. They'd love to play Gears. They'd love to play whatever, you know, or Forza. This is another one, actually. Forza, I want to play Forza. Yeah. But I've never really got, like, because the only, the only, uh, it's on PC, so I could play it on there, but I don't really want to play that on PC. Yeah, you want to play it on the console. I want to just play it on console, so. Um, so yeah, it makes sense from that perspective too. And I don't know, it's just like certain franchises, smaller games like Double Fine's games, like dude, you're just hurting that game by keeping it on Xbox. Yeah. Like you, 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 like just th- they're they're a developer too that has been on all devices. Well, look for at years. look so, at Cuphead. Yeah. Cuphead is like a perfect example of a game that was started out on Xbox, and mm-hmm. I think they allowed them to put it on Switch and then put it on the PS4 or one. Yes. Say? So. And they probably saw that. It was like, holy shit, we can. <laughs> our IPs are actually good, but it's just we're we just we're bottlenecking it to our our franchise, yeah. our, our our device. And I mean, of course, I'm not expecting them to put Halo on like, you know, this. But what we'll, what if they do this? What they like? Hey, we're going to release Halo One, Two, and Three. Put that on the PlayStation Four and, and Switch. Or just Master Chief Collection. Just Master Chief Collection, yeah. and then the at newest, this point, why not? Yeah, the newest Halo. People You've are like your sales off of. Xbox exclusivity. Yeah, and, and then the newest now too. So yeah, the newest Halo comes out right, and then pe- this Xbox only people are like you know what I really like Halo, so I will buy Xbox for this Halo. Like it just makes more sense to get people yeah. into your ecosystem. Yeah. Well, yeah, man, and then you could put Master Chief and Smash Bros. <laughs> Why not? I mean, yeah, let's make it happen. They got Banjo in there. Let's just get all of that Microsoft IP in there. Come on. That's what Smash is. Smash is gaming's mascot fighter. It's not Nintendo's. It's gaming's mascot It's a celebration. Of- it is. That's what it's turned into. Yeah. But anyways, we're not talking about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just think I think Microsoft's really thinking outside the box right now, and they're really thinking about the future of gaming, and it, it just makes a lot of sense. Like, I, I think exclusives will always be a thing as long as we have hardware like different companies making different devices yeah but it doesn't need to be everything it can be very few key games you don't need 35 exclusives on your console to sell your console yeah nobody's nobody has the time to play 35 exclusives i'm sorry yeah you you i mean you you're right and people but people use that they just trying to fuel the fanboy wars yeah dude whatever (laughs) god it's not practical like think of it practically when you have like the switches lineup of exclusives it's actually starting to get pretty long but when you think about the main ones right you're talking about you know now you've got fire emblem three houses Zelda Breath of the Wild, Mario Odyssey. Um, we're going to have a Pokemon Switch here soon, and then Luigi's Mansion, yeah. and like some of these smaller ones, Splatoon 2, yep. and stuff like that. But, dude, they had a solid ass lineup of a few exclusives that are worth the money, you know? Yeah. And that's what sells the console for me. Whereas Sony, they have a lot more exclusives, and that's the reason they're kind of my main console. But, like, if Microsoft had five or six really solid ass exclusives that I wanted to play, I might have an Xbox. I mean, I do have an Xbox now, but I might purchase one outside of you know normal yeah, circumstances. circumstances you know? Yeah. So and, and I, I tweeted that I tweeted Microsoft is moving in the right direction. Uh, and someone it was like a tweet that said like you know if you can choose the the game on which one which console which one it would be and why and I told I said Xbox I said they have the best online infrastructure right now uh, the UI I mean let's face it all console UIs kind of suck but oh they to me in my opinion Microsoft sucks less than the other ones yeah um and I was like man if they had the exclusivities of, of PS4 and yeah. and Switch yeah. I would definitely move on to certain consoles but sure. they don't so well, also their controller. The oh controller yeah, controller is really solid. Yeah, in my opinion, that's um, true. I like their controller a lot. So, yeah, and uh, honestly, when you're as behind as they are, it makes a lot of sense to do this too because it's much better to expose. This your is the good side of game. capitalism. Yeah, <laughs> it's much better to expose your game to 150 million potential customers than 50 million potential customers. Yeah. Like, so honestly, depending on how the next console cycle goes, like if they're behind the way they are this time, we're gonna see this for sure. Yeah, I mean, um, and it looks like they may not be behind for long because I remember last week Sony said some crazy shit about their plans and stuff like that. So. Mm. 
I don't know, man. We'll see. Yeah, but we'll see. I, I just, I just thought this was like really. It's cool. It's cool to hear them talk. They're, like their 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 Xbox team is really, really like thinking about the future. Yeah. You know, it's like we don't hear any of this stuff from Sony or Nintendo. Oh my really. god, I can already hear people calling us Xbox shoes. <laughs> Whatever, dude. I don't fucking play Xbox. I've literally not played a game on the Xbox One. I, I, ne- I not played a game on the Xbox One, so I am as far away from an Xbox fanboy as you can get. Yeah. So. Anybody call me that? Shut your mouth. I'm just recognizing strategy when I see it. Yeah. And it's like they're being very public about their strategy too, which is ballsy for sure. Because co- Sony could straight up just copy them, you know, if it works. I mean, Sony is gonna copy. Them. Probably that's <laughs> Sony's mo. Like that's what they do, man. So, but um, the thing is, like, Sony isn't talking about this stuff. Nintendo doesn't really talk about this stuff either. And it's just cool to see one, and I do just an integrated future where like I can play on my switch and log into my psn account and get trophies for games i'm playing on switch yeah that's something i want i want that that is such a i know trophies is like one of those things and achievements is one of those things a lot of people kind of like roll their eyes at um it's like oh whatever you get your, you're getting your digital points or whatever but it's like it does enhance my game experience okay you know? like when i really like a game and the trophy list is good yeah it's fun to pursue it's fun to pursue it. It can enhance a game for sure. If it's done poorly, it can make it's they're bad. Like yeah. it can be really bad and not fun. But um, if it's done right, it can be fun. So it's like one of those things. I would love to get certain games on Switch um, rather than PS4 and play them on Switch and get uh, get trophies on the Switch when I'm playing on the Switch. I'd rather play it on the Switch, but it's a game I want to get the platinum for, so I have to play it on PS. Four, you know? Yeah, and um, I feel the same way. I mean, when they announced that they were going to be doing some plans with like Switch, everyone were going crazy because mm-hmm. I mean that's a cool that's a cool little get up. Like I can play some Switch games, I can play some Xbox games on my Switch that can that are like you know the Switch can handle. Yeah, and everybody was thinking about Banjo Kazooie. Like a lot of people <laughs> were like tweeting like the rare combination. Please, rare replay. Yeah, give it to me. Cause yeah, I would love to play Jet for Gemini back on my on my Nintendo. Hell yeah, <laughs> hell yeah, hell yeah! Oh, give me all that Jet for Gemini. Yeah, so man. I don't know, man. Um, it's interesting to see what everyone else's strategy is going to be next console generation. Well, I mean, Nintendo's already there, but I'm really interested in seeing what PlayStation is going to do. I mean, because remember at one point PlayStation was this these people they were like being innovative. That's how we got the not games for gold, but uh, PlayStation Plus, PlayStation Plus. That's how we They're got the ones that. Who started that? Yeah. By the way. So yeah, and they don't always copy everybody. Yeah, else. that's what I'm saying. Like, they were they were the person I'm, who started I'm, that. I'm, by the way, I'm joking. They don't always copy. They've done innovative things. Yeah. But and it was you know. d- during that PS3 generation when they were down. They did the most. Yeah innovative shit yeah which is exactly my problem is that you have to be down in order to do innovative shit like yeah. come on yeah you know instead of trying to keep your lead yeah um so that's why I, that's the only reason i'm scared for the ps5 because i'm yeah. i'm scared sony's gonna try some outrageous shit in the wrong direction though <laughs> yeah i don't know we'll see i'm excited it's it's gonna be fun like we're, or maybe we're, they're... we're only a year and a half out yeah not even a year and like we're like 15 months away yeah from the release of these next consoles i mean we're getting close now yeah and i mean, honestly they're gonna be revealed soon i th- well i mean xbox was already revealed technically but um sony i imagine i'm, I'm really thinking they're gonna reveal it at psx okay sounds good i can see that either that or e3 next year maybe that sounds but, good um okay let's move on uh, we'll end the show with New game releases. Um, nothing big coming out this week, however. Fell Seal, Arbiter's Marks coming on Switch. And I forgot that this was happening. After after pointless, a lot of point. I say pointless, a lot, after a lot of point, podcasts saying, man, I wish this was on Switch. Man, I heard it's coming to Switch. Oh, shit, it's coming to Switch. Yeah, I, hey. well, dude, I don't know. I haven't thought about this for like oh, three months. So, you know, it's like the, the fact that it's on Switch now, hell yeah. This is a perfect game for handheld. Buy this game on the Switch. Just do it. Just do it. Do yourself a favor. If you like Final Fantasy Tactics or Tactics Ogre or Disgaea, buy this game on the Nintendo Switch and play it on Switch. That's all I have to say. That's the best game coming out this week. Bar none. Done. It's over. Anyway. Anything else that you would like to point out on the list? Uh, Friday the 13th. You got DC Universe that came out. Oh, that came out last week. That was Never last mind. week. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, yeah, Friday the 13th's out, y'all. You can get that. There's Woo! a Yu-Gi-Oh game coming out next week on Switch. Man, you know, you know what's crazy about Yu-Gi-Oh? I was thinking about this. We got, yeah. we got AR technology, man. Hell yeah, dude. We fuck? can do it. We can do it. Why now. is it not We're a thing? We're capable of doing it. I know. <laughs> they need re- what is Wizards of the Coast doing? <laughs> or fucking uh, who, Konami. Konami, who owns Yu-Gi-Oh. What are you guys doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Do you know how, how much money they will make? How have you not done this with AR? <laughs> I'm sure they're already, I'm sure they're researching it, but. If they Dude, release like a, 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 a AR headset with a pack of cards, do you know how many people would just battle in the streets? It would just be hell. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Pokemon Go, but way cooler. And then you can watch the uh, bystanders cooler. can watch their phone. What? Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Holy shit, dude! Oh my god! No, what are we doing? Oh my god! Yeah, let's let's go ahead and revolutionize the collectible trading card game, which you know. I think of magic on that shit. Yeah, magic. The freaking any whatever these card games are and then like you can change the field when you put out a field card oh yeah man i play my trap card my ball. <laughs> imagine like you 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 hit your uh your ar goggles or something like that uh, right that comes with a game yeah. and you turn the you turn the world around you into tomb world yeah. that would be fucking sweet montrell i laid this card face down and into my turn Everyone would be talking about. I would be talking about that. Oh hell yeah! Oh dude, I would be. I would be the worst. Our girlfriend wives would fucking hate us. They already do. (laughs) (laughs) They already do. (laughs) Climb (laughs) off. Hey Yugi. I play my blue eyes white dragon. Hi Joey, talk. Hey (laughs) Yug. Hey Yug. Hey Yug. I really love this red eyes black dragon you gave me. <laughs> Thanks, man. This won me so many duels. How did he have an Eastern accent? He's the worst. He's, oh, a, he's, he's the worst. He's Japan. Dude. He's like, he's, he's, dude, when he dueled, what was the dude, the dude who wore the America bandana? Oh, uh, <laughs> his name Keith or Kevin or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was the best. You have this stupid New York accent dude, with a New York accent fucking going the most America, America looking dude ever. Like, oh my god. Uh, but the, I mean, the best character in Yu-Gi-Oh is of course Maximilian Pegasus. Oh, oh yeah, Yu-Gi Boy. Yeah, it's Yu-Gi Boy. They let the they let the voice actors go crazy. Dude, it's awesome. <laughs> okay, I play my Toon World. What will you do now, Kaiba Boy? Man. Oh, good stuff. Man, that's the blast from the past. Guys, we're going real off topic this episode. I hope you don't mind. Hey, man, it's, this is a pretty fun episode. This is the player's take, man. We talk about some bullshit, whatever we <laughs> want. <laughs> As I've heard on other podcasts, this is a conversational podcast. Yeah. You know, if, we get on a, if we get on a tangent, we're just going to follow it, you know? But uh, I think we're done. Yep, that's it for me. That's going to be all. All right, guys. Uh, we've done it again. We're under an hour 30. Good job, Montreal. Well done. So, if you liked this episode, please like the episode, review the episode, and subscribe to the show on whatever feed you are listening to it on. Uh, And please share it with your friends. We would like to grow the audience. We want more people. We want to start talking to people. We want to interact with people. So please do that. If you'd like to talk to us on Twitter, you can do so uh, at I trap for the Hokage for Montreal. That is the number four, not the word. I am at Thunderdome zero one. The podcast is at the Players Take. If you'd like to send us questions, you can do so on Twitter, or you can send them to the Players Take zero one at gmail dot com. Um, I didn't mention this at the top of the episode, but next week Montreal is going to be out of town, so we are recording, pre-recording another uh, reflections episode. Um, I don't know the topic yet. We have a couple things we're thinking about, so. Um, you will see that next week. After that, I think we will be on a more normal cadence for a while. Yes, so yeah, for a while. We'll neither be. of us should be going anywhere. So, uh, so look forward to more normal shows at the end of August four. All right, we hope you guys enjoyed this one, and we will see you on the next one. Bye, guys. Bye, bye.